In the previous video, I showed you how the idea of conservation of mechanical energy could be modified so that we could still use mechanical energy concepts to solve problems even when non-conservative forces are acting. Here's the idea. In a process where all forces acting are conservative, then the change in kinetic energy during the process plus the change in potential energy during the process is equal to zero. On the other hand, if non-conservative forces are acting during the process, we say instead that the change in kinetic energy during the process plus the change in potential energy during the process is equal to the work done by non-conservative forces during the process. So in this video, we're going to be using this version of the mechanical energy equation to solve an example problem. As with the previous example problems, where only conservative forces were acting and therefore mechanical energy was conserved, we're going to be using this handout here, which is available from the module introduction. So let's look at the example problem. This is a problem we could actually solve using other methods, but in order to get practice with this new method, we're going to be solving it using energy ideas. So here's the example problem. We have an incline here, and then we have a mass which starts out at the bottom of the incline, moving up the incline with some initial speed. There is friction between the mass and the incline, and the coefficient of kinetic friction is given. So given the mass, 3.5 kilograms, the initial speed, 8 meters per second, coefficient of kinetic friction, 0 0.45, and the angle of the incline, 30 degrees, we want to know how far up the incline does the mass go before it comes to rest due to the action of friction and gravity. So let's start by looking at the handout. As in the previous problems we did using the handout, we're going to start by drawing diagrams illustrating the initial and final situations. And to make sure things don't get too cluttered, I'm going to come over here and just draw the mass in its initial situation, moving along at a speed V initial. And it's going to go up the incline by some distance, which we don't know, but we're going to try and figure out. And then the mass reaches some point on the incline where it comes to rest. And then it would have a final speed of zero. So here we have our figure of the initial situation. And here we have our figure of the final situation. Okay, so step B, set the zero level for gravitational potential energy. So I'm putting my zero level here. That means that the mass will start with gravitational potential energy of zero. And then in the final situation, the gravitational potential energy will be positive. Now we go to step two. We have option A, if all forces are conservative. So friction is acting, that's a non-conservative force. So we go to option B. And here it says, compute gravitational potential, spring potential, and kinetic energy for both initial and final situations, and compute the work done by all conservative forces. We can ignore spring potential energy because there are no springs in this problem, but we will need to compute expressions for gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy in the initial and final situations, and we will also need to compute the work done by friction because that is a non-conservative force. Okay, so we need an expression for initial kinetic energy and initial gravitational potential energy. We need an expression for final kinetic energy and we need an expression for final gravitational potential energy. And we also need an expression for the work done by friction because that is the non-conservative force acting in this problem. Okay, so why don't you pause the video and try and work out 
as much of this as you can on your own, then rejoin the video. Okay. In the initial situation, the kinetic energy is one half the mass times the initial speed squared. The mass starts at the zero level, so the initial gravitational potential energy is zero. In the final situation, the mass has come to rest, so the kinetic energy is zero. All right, how about the final gravitational potential energy? So let's look at the formula here. At the zero level, of course, the gravitational potential energy is zero. But if you start at the zero level and go up a height h vertically from the zero level, then the gravitational potential energy is mgh. Now, this height h here refers to a vertical distance. So we have to be careful here because this mass is moving along the incline. What we're interested in is the vertical distance in here. So I'm going to draw a right triangle. So the base of the right triangle will be horizontal. And then the vertical leg will go up to the mass. So there's our right angle in there. The hypotenuse of the triangle is the distance that the mass moved along the incline. And then the height here that we're looking for is the side opposite the theta. So this height must be the magnitude of that displacement here multiplied by the sine of theta. So coming back to here, what would be the final gravitational potential energy? I can write mgh, but as we saw here, h is equal to the magnitude of the displacement times sine of theta, where theta is the angle of the incline. Now we get to the work done by friction. So let's use our general formula for work. Our general formula for work is magnitude of the force, which would be here, a kinetic friction force, times magnitude of the displacement. That's what we're looking for. And then times the sine of the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector. So before we proceed with this, let's draw a force diagram for the mass. And then we can think about what would be the magnitude of the frictional force and what would be the angle between the frictional force and the displacement vector. As usual, we can start our force diagram by drawing a dashed line around the mass. And as usual, we can start by putting in the gravitational force. Magnitude mg. And go around the dashed line. And the only thing reaching in through the dashed line to touch the mass is the incline itself. So the incline exerts two forces, a normal force perpendicular to the incline, and then a frictional force opposite the motion of the mass. The magnitude of the normal force would be n, and the magnitude of the kinetic frictional force would be mu k n. Let's also put in the displacement vector. I want to be clear that even though I have my displacement vector here in the force diagram, it's not a force. So maybe I'll put some squiggles through the displacement vector so that it doesn't look like a force vector. Uh, anyways, let's go back to our expression for the work done by friction. The magnitude of the kinetic friction force would be mu k n. Magnitude of the displacement, I will just leave like that. Now, what would be the sign of the angle between the frictional force and the displacement vector? Well, the frictional force and the displacement vector, you can see, are pointing in exactly opposite directions. So the angle between them is 180. So I can put in here sine 180. Sine of 180 is minus 1. So when I come down to the next line, I'll turn that into minus 1. So we're almost there, but can you see that we need some kind of an expression for the magnitude of the normal force? 
So to get to get an expression for the magnitude of the normal force, we're going to need to do a force balance. So let's do a force balance in the direction perpendicular to the incline. So to do that, I will put in X and Y axes as usual, and then we will do a force balance in the Y direction. So Y axis perpendicular to the incline. X axis along the incline. So as usual, we end up with an angle theta between the gravitational force vector and the minus y direction. So let's apply Newton's second law along the y direction. We have sum of y components of forces equals mass times y component of acceleration now, all of the motion here is along the incline. We set the incline along the x direction. There is no acceleration perpendicular to the incline along the y direction. So y component of acceleration would be zero. So we're just gonna sum up the y components of the forces. So for the normal force, the y component is just the magnitude because the normal force points along the plus y direction. Now with the gravitational force, Doing a bit of a shortcut here, you can just project onto the minus y direction, and you can see that the y component here is, sorry, minus mg cosine theta. So y component of normal force and y component of gravitational force minus mg cosine theta. That's equal to zero. So we get n equals mg cosine theta. So now we want to take this expression and put it back into here in our expression for the work done by friction. So I want to be clear on what's happening here. Let's call this equation star. Now we can, now we can take our expression for the normal force and put it back into our equation for the work done by friction. And that gives us for work done by friction, Minus, I'll put that minus in front now, mu k, mg cosine theta, then times magnitude of the displacement. So coming back to our sheet, we have now done step two. Now we go to step three. We have option A, if all forces are conservative, we have friction here, friction is non-conservative. So we use option B. And in option B, we're going to write down this equation here and make our substitutions. Okay, so I'll just copy this down. Change in gravitational potential plus, well, we can skip change in spring potential because there's no springs in this problem. We'll just go to change in kinetic energy equals work done by non-conservative forces. Okay, change in anything is final value minus initial value. So change in gravitational potential is final gravitational potential minus initial gravitational potential. Change in kinetic energy is kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial. And that is equal to the work done by non-conservative forces. Here we only have friction as a non-conservative force. So this becomes work done by friction. Okay, substituting. Initial gravitational potential is zero. Final kinetic energy is zero. But everything else we have to substitute. So final gravitational potential is this expression. Initial kinetic energy is this expression. And work done by friction is that expression down here. I'm going to put that D in front of the cosine theta. Okay, so now we are clear to go ahead and solve for that distance up the incline that the mass traveled. Notice that each of the terms has an M, so we can divide through by M and get rid of those. Now, after doing that, what I want to do 
is take all of the terms that have magnitude displacement and put those on the left. So I'm going to take this expression and put it on the left. And then that minus one half mv squared is going to come to the right. And after I have done that, I get from this term, g magnitude displacement sine theta. This term comes over to the left and they get plus mu k g magnitude displacement cosine theta equals the initial squared over two. Okay, so almost there. On the left side, I'm going to factor out g times magnitude displacement, and that is multiplied by sine theta plus mu k cosine theta. Have all of that equal to v initial squared over two. Now, now move everything which is not magnitude of displacement down to the denominator on the right, and I get magnitude displacement equals the initial squared, and all of that divided by 2g, and then quantity sine theta plus mu k cosine theta. Now, as usual, we substitute numerical values along with units. Initial speed squared, eight meters per second, quantity squared. All of that over two, and then G, 9.8 meters per second squared. Then we have sine 30 plus 0 0.45 times cosine 30. Now, substituting, the numerical value I get is 3.67, but let's do our unit checking. In the numerator, we have meters squared over seconds squared. In the denominator, meters over seconds squared. Seconds squared cancel seconds squared. Then we have meters squared over meters gives us meters, which is what we would expect for a distance. Okay. So now we have done our first example problem where we have extended the idea of mechanical energy to situations where non-conservative forces are acting.